Story. The kingdom of heaven will soon be here, brother. Turn back to God. Baptism is a sign that you intend to live for God, so be alert. Someone more powerful than me is going to come. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The kingdom of... This is my own dear son, and I am pleased with him. God blesses those people who depend only on... Uh, uh. Those people who grieve will find co... Uh, uh, there are too many people to hear me from the beach. Would you row me out a little so I could teach from there? Mm -hmm. God blesses those people who grieve. They will find comfort. God blesses those people who are humble. The earth will belong the to them. Down. God blesses the those flooded who want and the winds rain. blew and beat against that house. Finally, it fell with a crash. Row your boat out into the deep water and let your nets down to catch some fish. We've worked hard all night long and haven't got a thing, but if you tell me to, I'll let the nets down. Don't be afraid. Follow me. And from now on, you will bring in people instead of fish. That was an interesting story about Jesus and the disciples. It's your girl, Ethel See you next week. Bye! Good morning, following Jesus, and good morning, everyone else that is joining us. We welcome you this morning, and even as we are worshiping, today we have Lerato, we have Naomi, we have Jabulani, and then we've got Dumisani right there at the back doing the sound for us. So we just want to invite you to come and worship and just let God speak to us this morning.
You 
why we worship you. We give you all the honor and the praise because you are God. King of kings and Lord of lords, we exalt you, O oh God, mighty God. San Bonani, Manguanani, Absheni, Machiloni. Good morning, good morning. For those who don't know who I am, my name is Baba Lotekiso, and I have the awesome, awesome privilege of leading this community of following Jesus. Worship team, you guys are the best. Thank you, Siabong, Arialebucha, Bayadanki, for saving us all the time with your gifts and talent. 
We don't take what you do for us for granted. We really appreciate you and we mean it. Listen, if you are joining us for the first time, we want to say to you, welcome to Following Jesus. We want to give you a special warm welcome. We enjoy having new people come fellowship with us. It's a special time for us when we have new people. If you've been joining us for some time, welcome back. It's so good that you are back here with us. And for us who call FJ their home, Gumnandi Gakulu Ugbalana with you all. Today is Women's Day. This means we take time to pause and reflect the brave protest action taken by the women on the 9th of March in 1956. On this day, 64 years ago, more than 20,000 South African women of all races staged a march on the Union buildings in protest against the proposed amendments to the Urban Areas Act of 1950. Many people knew it as the past law. National Women's Day here in South Africa is an attempt to draw the attention to significant issues women still face, such as domestic violence, sexual harassment in the workplace and everywhere else, unequal pay and other forms of abuse that women still face today. So if you are a woman and listening in today, we want to take this special, special time and say we know there is a long way to go for us as a country, but today we want to take a moment and pause and say, we see you, we honor you, we value you, we appreciate you, and we celebrate you. Here at Following Jesus, we love serving along our women. And as the leadership, we want to commit and continue to seek ways that will be part of the healing story of this pandemic of domestic violence in our community and in our country at large. Tina City la e following Jesus malibongwe igama la makosikazi malibongwe watinta abafazi watintim bogoto which means if you strike a woman you strike a walk women will love you will love you so here at following Jesus as a community diversity and healing are two of our ongoing priorities and as a church this month we are dedicating our efforts in exploring what this means in the context of women's month we are intentionally taking time to amplify the voices and experiences of women. And today, through our panel that is dynamic and that is so diverse, we address this pandemic called gender-based violence. I want to implore you, I want to encourage you to take time to listen. Allow time of reflection as we hear what God has put in the hearts of our panelists today. So let's take a listen to the conversation with them. And I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, we have Kanye, who, for people who come to follow in Jesus, will know her. Um, she's a familiar face. Kanye is a, is a youth leader in our church, and she's also passionate about issues of youth development in this country, and I guess in Africa. And uh, we also have Sylvester Mashilo, who is a businessman, and an author, um, he probably will tell us about his book in part of the conversation as we go along. And he's also a victim of sexual abuse himself, but he's turned that story around and he's now a mentor to boys and men on positive uh, manhood. So welcome, Sylvester. And we also have Reverend uh, Bafana Kumalo, who is a co-executive director at Sonke Gender Justice and is also one of the organization's co-founders. We have also on our panel, Deline Clark, who is an advocate specializing in sexual offenses and family law. But today, Deline is here in her personal capacity as a member of society and as a woman as well. So I would like to welcome you all on this panel. It's so good to have you and we appreciate you taking the time to be with us uh, on this panel. Why are we having this conversation? I just need to say that as a church following Jesus, we are a community that always seeks ways that can bring healing to society. There are many social ills that we see around us. And as a church, our core values include healing and this, part, this conversation formed part of that, where we're hoping that um, some of the conversations that we'll have will bring healing 
and awareness to those who will be listening to this conversation. So we are not having this conversation because it's only Women's Month. This is a continuous conversation we're having in our church um, in terms of issues around gender-based violence, issues about racism, issues about social uh, justice and all of that. So, but we are grateful for this opportunity that we can right now create a space where we can dedicate time to talk about these issues and hopefully um, those who are listening can, can be inspired and can gain awareness and can join in becoming voices for the stop of gender-based violence in our country. So we, we appreciate your time and we are grateful. I'm just quickly going to pray for us and ask God to lead us in this conversation because we believe that without God, nothing can actually go right. So we do this not in our own strength, but we ask for strength from him. So God of justice, God of mercy, God of love, God of grace, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. We thank you that you are making us your vessels who can speak on your behalf. Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit can come and guide us during this time. Lord, we believe that this moment is a catalyst moment for other people. We believe there are people who are going to hear this message and their hearts will be softened, their hearts will be turned, and Lord, you will do work in their hearts. We are praying for a better South Africa. We are, be we are praying for a better world where women and children will stop being abused by men in this world, in this country. In Jesus' name, we ask you to guide us and to be with us in this conversation. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to start with, uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Reverend uh, Bafana Kumalo. Um, in the work that you are doing with uh, Sonke Gender uh, Justice, you know, a lot of people, when we talk about gender-based violence, they, they, they might just think that we're talking about physical abuse of children and men. But my understanding is that actually there are levels to, to gender-based violence. For an example, there is financial violence that women are experiencing in their homes or in society where women are not paid the same amount of money as men and all those such, uh, such things. In simple terms, if you had to explain to someone who doesn't understand what gender-based violence is about, how would you describe it for that person? Well, gender-based violence, of course, uh, takes many formats, um, as you have indicated. Uh, it's physical, uh, it's emotional, it is psychological, uh, but also it is economic. Um, and, 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 and the problem is that the major focus of everybody is on the physical aspect of gender-based violence. We want to see no eyes, we want to see somebody who's been, you know, physically abused. Um, but I, I think we need to take into cognizance that the other forms of violence are just as devastating as the physical form of violence. I, I often argue that, in fact, emotional and psychological violence is even more devastating, you know, uh, because that stays with you. Uh, bruises can go away and heal, uh, but what somebody does to you emotionally and psychologically can stay with you for a long time. Mm. That does not mean that you know physical violence is not um, uh, uh, as abrasive. Um, uh, you know, it's it's the, the fact is that we need there. There are many men, for instance, who say, "No, I never, I don't abuse my partner or my wife." Uh, by that they mean I don't physically abuse my partner, but they are emotionally abusing their partners every day. And so when we talk about gender-based violence, we need to look at the whole continuum because the fact that you don't abuse your partner physically doesn't mean you are not abusive because you may still be emotionally abusive, you may be psychologically abusive. What is the emotional abuse? I mean, Human beings were very strange. You know, when you meet somebody, you get attracted and you're able to show appreciation by describing how you may love them for, you know, how you got attracted to them.
But when things begin to go south, people use uh, emotional abuse. You know, somebody will body shame. You know, look, we are so fat. You know, um, I actually was doing you a favor. You know, um, or you know, you're not taking care of yourself. All of that contributes to violence because you are making the other person feel less than how God has created them. And it's important that as human beings, we need to acknowledge that all of us are created in the image of God. And when God creates a human being, God does not make a mistake. You know, everyone is perfect in their own way. And we need to appreciate people for who they are and what they are. And, and so <clears throat> when, when you say to somebody, you're a stupid, you know, that's an emo emotion, emotional abuse. You know, or somebody gives your partner a silent, um, you know, because you are angry about something, you don't talk to them. You know, when they ask for something, you don't respond. That's psychological abuse, you know, because nobody deserves to be treated lesser than what they are. And so all these forms of violence are just as devastating. And of course, you know, sexual harassment, um, which many men, you know, take for granted, you know, no, 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 I just touched her bum. No, I just squeezed her, 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 her breasts. You know, it's, it's abuse. And that is traumatic for women because to have to walk out and always have to look over your shoulder that there's no man who's going to be touching you inappropriately causes a lot of trauma uh, for women. And so I think it's important that we need as we, particularly as people of the church, because there's a lot of harassment and violence that happens in the context of faith communities, which many people will never describe as, as violence. And, and these are the issues that I think we need to be alive to, because it does impact on people's spirituality, it impacts on people's own identity and self-assurance about who they are. Sure, sure. Thank you for that uh, description. And I think some of us as young boys who grew up in the township, um, we, were, we were actually taught the opposite. When a woman is walking past, you know, you whistle, you, you force yourself to talk to her. If she says, I don't want to talk to you, then you, you turn back and say funny things to her. And at the time, you don't realize that actually you are abusing that person in the way you are addressing her. And that awareness is important for us as a community to know that those behaviors are actually psychological and emotional abuse. So thank you so much. But you've touched on another issue of you know, gender-based violence uh, activities happening in the church. And I want to go to Kanye and ask Kanye, Kanye, Reverend is saying um, the church actually experiences these issues of gender-based violence, which a normal person in the church might not even be aware of. And I want to ask you, Kanye, as a woman, how has gender-based violence affected you in your daily life? And what has been your experience in how the church itself, um, either our church, FJ, or any other church you've been part of, tends to handle the issues of gender-based violence? Um, I think if I have to share my own story um, of gender-based violence is I have become a complete uh, prisoner to my own, um, my own paranoia. Um, our country is already riddled with crime and now you add gender-based violence. So I cannot leave the house without planning. Um, I have to plan my routes. I have to plan, okay, I'm going to walk this distance and there's usually some men there or construction men so i need to prepare my mind of how they they might just say things that might be very um hurtful and i have to you know what we do now sometimes we even have to walk around with earphones um and not even play anything just so that we're not hearing what people are saying um because it's very hurtful things like jogging what an honor it is to just go around your community and jog we cannot do that you know, because it's either you worried about your safety or you worried of comments. I mean, the comments are actually quite painful, as you've said. Um, and I grew up around them as, as young as eight years old. I had to worry about comments, about my body, about being a girl, about... And it hasn't stopped. It has not stopped. It's actually gotten worse. Eight years old as a girl, I had to worry about comments of boys, of men. 
you know, about my body as I was developing. It starts there. It starts there. And um, I think we really have to be careful um, about um, how we speak and respond um, to men. So even if I'm at a shop and there's a guy who's maybe too close, how I respond to him and say, hey, sorry, sir, you're too close. Um, I need to be careful how I respond to even issues like that. So I'm always, um, in, I'm always in danger. I'm always aware of my surroundings. And that's my life. And, and at night as well, I wake up um, twice to check if everything really is locked um, in the house. So, and as I say, there's like this thin line between the crime in this country and gender-based violence um, as well. So it's, it's, it's a bit confusing to even explain as a woman how, how I feel. And, and moving to the question about my experience with church, um, I think that the, the church um, for the longest of time has, has put the emphasis on women. If you act a certain way as a woman, um, then you, 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 you project purity and therefore men will treat you with purity. You know, and, and just at th that's so dangerous um, to, 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 to keep communicating, dress like this, walk like this, act like this. It's all put on the woman and gender-based violence really is not a woman issue. It's a man issue, you know? So I think the church has just always twisted it. And I think one of the things I want to add is that if, if church became a safe space, a true honest space for men, where they can talk, where they can share, not just socially and praying, but just almost like support group for those who are overwhelmed, who don't understand, then I think there would be so much change and difference and men in the church could lead the country into the, a solution for gender-based violence. Sure. You know, when you say that, Kanye, um, about your experiences as a, as a woman, I have two daughters and you say you were eight years old when you started experiencing these things. And my daughters are seven and four, and you say the situation has gotten worse. Chances are my kids have already experienced it and they're not yet aware, or they're gonna experience it sooner rather than later. And if this doesn't change, I'll be sitting with a problem where I have to counsel, uh, explain, comfort, because my girls will be going through the same thing. So. Really, this needs to change because it cannot continue the way things are. And as you said, it's been happening for a longest time. So many of us, Delin, I'm going to jump straight into it, you know, when it comes to the issues of the law and all of that. Many of us have heard about a protection order in one way or the other. But not all of us know what a protection order is and how it works. In simple language, what is a protection order and who qualifies to apply for one? So a protection order is something that one can obtain through using the processes available in the Domestic Violence Act. It's basically a piece of paper that is issued by the court telling an, a domestic violence abuser that they may not continue with the abuse that they've been meeting out. And it is accompanied by a suspended warrant of arrest. So essentially what happens is it's a warning which effectively tells a person not to do certain things like not to verbally abuse a person, emotionally abuse a person, or to physically attack them. And if they then do it, even though they've been warned, the suspended warrant of arrest is activated and they then must be arrested. And they then face a penalty of five years imprisonment or a 100,000 rand fine. So that's essentially what that is. And in terms of who may apply for a protection order, it's anyone who's in a domestic relationship as defined in the Domestic Violence Act. So that's anyone who is married, who is living in the same residence. So it can be a grandparent against a grandchild who's abusing them. It can be people who are living in a residence, for example, um, at a university sharing a residence, uh, people in, in different rooms, but in the same residence or in a commune. So it's anyone living in a domestic setting that falls within the definition of domestic violence. And the abuse doesn't necessarily have to be physical. Any type of abuse that they experience, they can go lay a domestic violence uh, case. Oh, absolutely, look, the, the, the domestic violence uh, definition is, is really quite broad. It's not only physical abuse. 
often you'll know that domestic violence starts off with something much smaller and progresses to physical abuse and may actually even progress to murder or what we call femicide. So essentially it's emotional abuse, verbal abuse, it's even economic abuse. So for example, if a husband takes a, 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 the, the wife's bank card and keeps it to himself and doesn't allow her access to any funds, um, that sort of thing is all part of the broader definition of what domestic violence is. Sure. Yeah, that's helpful. That's helpful. So, but um, Delin, can you just, cont uh, just maybe elaborate broader for us here? We've had, I mean, even the guys on the panel have touched on it. We've had cases of women and stories of women and children who are continually being abused by their partners or guardians, even when they have a protection order. What happens if the abusive partner does not abide by the protection order? What avenues are there for the abused person to take forward the matter? Well, look, there's various, various avenues available to people who are abused in their home or experience domestic violence. First of all, if it is a crime, then they can go directly to the police and actually lay a criminal charge. But they don't have to. And there's reasons why a lot of people don't want to go that route. So they have another option, and that is to apply for a protection order, which tells the person, look, in terms of a civil process, you may not do A, B, and C. They may actually apply for a protection order and lay a charge of um, a criminal charge. But a lot of people are scared of actually laying a criminal charge. And the reason for that is that you might be financially dependent on your abuser. And if your abuser is prosecuted for that offense, they will have a criminal record and may lose, lose their jobs, which impacts on the broader family. Sure. And, and then legally, what can they do or what, where can they go if somebody who's abusing them is not taking the protection order seriously? Can they, is, it, is the police the only avenue or can they go to the court? What else can they do? Well, look, essentially what happens when you apply for a protection order, you can, if, if you are a victim of abuse, you can either go to, straight to the police or you can go to your nearest magistrate's court. The police will then refer you, if you don't want to lay a criminal charge, they can then refer you to the court as well, where you can apply for a protection order. The process in terms of that is that the magistrate will then, what they call in chambers, consider your affidavit, which explains the abuse that you've been um, subjected to, and will then consider whether he will immediately give you an interim protection order. If he, if he or she gives you an interim, interim protection order, it will be accompanied by a suspended warrant of arrest, which the sheriff, sheriff will then take to the abuser and um, serve on the abuser, explaining what the process is. Thereafter, the parties will have to come back to court so that the court can confirm that protection order. So essentially, um, once you have that protection order and the suspended warrant of arrest, it is actually sent to your nearest police station. So if the person decides to ignore it, you can pick up the phone or you can ask someone to notify the police and they immediately need to attend to you or as soon as possible um, attend to the matter. And they will then need to arrest the person because a suspended warrant of arrest is already in their possession as well. There's no choice around that. If they don't do that, one could always follow through other processes and that is reporting the police, um, the police officer for not doing his job to the independent police investigative directorate or one step before that would be to the um, commanding officer at that police station. But essentially there's no choice in terms of arrest where the person has actually breached the protection order. Sure. Okay, no, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you so much for that explanation. Sylvester, I wanna move to you. Um, as, as, as somebody who is a male, who's also experienced sexual abuse, how do you think your experience growing up has shaped your view of women and how you treat women? And how do you think um, this has affected you as a man as you were growing up? Thank you so much for, for the opportunity to share part of my story. Here, here's what I can say. If you think of a complete puzzle, I would say that my life was a complete puzzle, that at some point in time, the puzzle was broken up. And God has 
started restoring that puzzle, which used to be complete and is now uh, going towards completion once again. But what happened in, in my upbringing, uh, I was physically, emotionally, and sexually abused as, as a young boy. My first recollection was at the age of nine when I was sexually abused. And the shame that came with it is that I lost a sense of worth. I lost a sense of worth. And there was a deep emptiness inside me. Those three forms of abuse that I experienced as a young boy, I, I had a deep sense of, of emptiness and needed to fill the void. Now, constructively, when there's a void to fill, you can fill it constructively or you can fill it in a very destructive way. And uh, I filled it in a very destructive way. I got married at the young age of 24. And I got married for all the wrong reasons, if, if ever there's such a thing as, as all the wrong reasons. I was trying to fill a void. And I thought marriage would complete me. I thought another human being would complete me. And it was very unfair of me to have an expectation that another human being would complete me because only God did you. Mm -hmm. And in my miscues in, in my marriage, and I can only appreciate certain things in hindsight. Because I did not love myself, I couldn't believe that any other person could love me and love me for, for me, just me being so best and nothing else besides that. And my low self-esteem was coupled with the fact that if, if any female person uh, sort of took a liking to me, uh, I was gone. You know, I, I was completely sold because I didn't have a sense of, of worth. My worth was in the validation of others and in particular, I went on to abuse others as well. You know, I, as I started growing up, uh, I went into business, uh, I started amassing wealth and with that uh, came the, the ease and the opportunity to use wealth to abuse women to be a blesser, uh, to use money to surround myself with young girls, and to, to really use my power, rank, and privilege in a way that continues uh, gender-based violence. And of course, in that, in that time when I was in my own darkness, I couldn't appreciate uh, the hurt that I was causing. I couldn't appreciate it, I was part of the problem. Because what I tried to do was rationalize it, you know. I would say, for instance, but I don't give the woman money. I only buy them drinks and I buy them food. But what's the difference? It was actually the same thing. But I had found a way to sort of rationalize it and say, but mine is the milder version of being a blesser. And actually, I'm not a blesser. And it's because I wasn't honest with myself. Uh, I wasn't honest with myself that I was a problem, that I could go back and look at my own upbringing. I could go back and look at my own abuse, but I still had a choice and I knew what was right and what was wrong. I knew what was right and what was wrong. Here's what I struggled with. In my own power, I just could not walk away from my dark past. You know, there were days when I would reflect on my actions and I would say, I will never do it again. Particularly when I came back from church, you know, I'd come back from church and I'd be filled with the Holy Spirit and I'd be upbeat and I'd say, you know what, I've left that life behind me. But I can tell you what would happen. No sooner than I have made that declaration, I would start getting messages on my phone. I would start getting nude pictures on my phone. I started getting invitations, you know, come over, the husband is gone, and so on and so forth. And that spirit was stronger than the spirit that said, don't go there. At that point, it was stronger. I just didn't have it inside of me to resist the temptation. I didn't have the tools in terms of how am I going to deal with now this new walk, in spite of all of these temptations. And I can look back now and say one year on, 
uh, I have, if I can use the proverbial word, I've been clean for a year. I have not uh, gone back to my dark past uh, over the past year, but because I got to a stage where it was, I had a choice. I could either continue living the life that I led and I would die a physical death. I had already died a, phys a, a, a spiritual death before, but now it was a question of a physical death. And I had a choice. I could either continue with that life, but I probably would not be alive today, or I could choose to turn my life back to Christ. And that really has been my work for the past year. And when I talk about doing work with boys and men, I have found healing myself doing that work with boys and men. I have found that being able to be a support to others also helps me with my own work and keeping me honest and having an accountable system that really helps me in understanding without blame and judgment that I am on a path, I am on a journey. I have not arrived and I probably will never arrive, but that this support system provides me the daily renewal that is required for me to stay on my journey. Sure. Sure. So this 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 experience you had, Sylvester, even when you were trying to run away from it, it just kept coming back, coming back. And subconsciously, you might have known that it's the cause of your behavior, but some people don't even know that the way they were raised is actually adding to the way they are behaving themselves. And if they don't know that they are upbringing is adding towards their behavior, then it becomes a problem. So the work you do with men and boys, I guess it's helpful. It's part of the step that we need to be taking. But there's something I, that you, you mentioned and can you mention? And I wanna take this question to Reverend Bafana. You know, you, you, you said you are a church person, but you still yeah. found yourself yeah. abusing women in different ways. Can you also mention something about <clears throat> churches being, creating a safe space for women, and children. But Reverend Bafana, many people believe that the cycle of violence against women and children only happens out there in the world and not in the church, you know? I mean, how can the, the, the holy man of God do such a bad thing? But we've heard stories and we continue to see stories of pastors or men in the church abusing wives or abusing their, some of their church members and how can the church do better in this area of gender-based violence from preaching to how we do things? How can the church do better? Thanks, Pavolo, for that question. I think it's an important question. Um, the, the first thing the church must do is own up that, um, you know, a church is part of society. Um, you know, the, 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 the Bible actually reminds us that as the church, we need to be the salt uh, of the earth and the light of the world. Uh, but I, I sometimes think that if we do a proper reflection, um, we, we sometimes are, uh, you know, the, 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 the opposite of what uh, Jesus was calling for. And I'm grateful for these two young people who you know, clearly are dynamic in their own sense, just listening to them, you can see that these are leaders um, for, for our society um, who <clears throat> have been able to see some of these contradictions that we find um, in our society. I mean, the point that Kanye made, you know, as a woman, before she leaves her home, she needs to think, what am I going to wear? Not, not because of how she wants to feel, but how not to attract danger on herself. Now, that's not normal. You know, when you have to think, um, where do I go and job? That's not normal. You know, and, and, and when you have to, 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 to be a Sylvester who says, how do I get my validation? I need to do this to women so that I can you know, reassert my own uh, uh, personality. You know, it's not normal. And, and I, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, both of them are raising very fundamental issues because 
if young people begin to engage with these issues, then our country has got a future. Because it's only through that kind of engagement that we can, you know, address these challenges that are confronting us. Now, you are asking a question. The, the, the biggest myth, Pablo, is that people always say gender-based violence happens in Mkukus, in the informal settlements, in the townships. There's no bigger lie than that. Gender-based violence knows no sex, it knows no gender, it knows no status, it knows no race. It happens everywhere. It happens in Sentin, it happens in Soweto, it mm. happens in Kuguletu. You know, it happens to an executive of a company. It happens to a, 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 a street vendor, you know. All of it is driven by what I call patriarchy, which is part of the system that drives this notion that the world can only be seen through the eyes of men, to the gratification of men, to the satisfaction of men. And in that scheme of things, everything else is subordinate to men. And, and for me, we need to disabuse ourselves as people of faith by thinking that we are immune from these challenges. Truth of the matter is that we are part of this society. In fact, I was talking in another session uh, earlier in the week. You know, Statistics South Africa tells us that over 80% of people in South Africa are confirmed Christians or people who self-assure affirm as Christians. Now, if we have these high levels of violence in South Africa, the truth of the matter is that majority of people who are causing those uh, episodes are Christians. These are people that sit in our pews. These are people that listen to our sermons. These are people that sometimes when they preach, you think, hey, the heavens will open and we'll all go to heaven at this time. They preach so powerfully in church and go home and behave like animals. Now, that's the problem we need to confront. Not to think that because we are people of faith, we do not fall short of some of these challenges. Because when we do that, we are actually perpetuating and sweeping things under the carpet. Let me make an example. Most of our churches were very strict laws about dress codes. But most of those dress codes, if you look at them very carefully, they're usually directed at women. You know, there'll be things about, no, don't wear shirt skirts, don't show a cleavage, don't do this, don't do that. Now, I remind Christians that, you know, Jesus had a very important lesson for those kinds of uh, behaviors. Jesus says very appropriately, if you have a problem with your eye, because your eye goes to church, instead of focusing on the cross, you look at other things, such that you see that women are wearing short skirts. Jesus gives a very practical uh, 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 solution. Take it out, take that eye out because it's not serving you. When you are in church, you are there to focus on worship, worshiping the Lord. And who and what, who is wearing what, it's none of your business. Because why are you looking at a woman's uh, thighs to see that she's wearing a short skirt? What are you looking for there? Because he didn't come there to check who's wearing what skirt and, and, and who's showing a cleavage. And Jesus says, if your hand is troubling you because it likes to land where it should not, cut it off because it's causing you to sin. And this is the kind of message that we need to bring very strongly within the faith-based community because sometimes a lot of the violence is perpetrated in church all in the name of religion. You know, you have in some of our denominations, people will say, no, I dreamt about you. You know, Kanye, I couldn't sleep. God told me you are my wife. But of course, I mean, I've got nothing wrong with God saying Kanye can be my wife. But God must also send the same message to Kanye to say your husband is Bafana, you know. Then the message is complete. Because how is it that God can talk to you and not talk to Kanye? But... I mean, I, I, I was fascinated by a, a one young, man, young woman who was bothered by this pastor who kept saying, no, 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 you know, this is what God is showing me. And this young woman said, no, let me go and pray so that God can also reveal to me. And after two weeks, she came back and said, hey, Mfundis, you know, God indeed does speak and he revealed to me, but unfortunately revealed to me a different person. 
Now, what do you do? Which, 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 which dream do you validate? Do you validate it because it's a man or because it's a woman? Now, that ended that whole story of people saying, no, 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 God has shown me whatever. Now, Babalo, I'm not teaching the fact that God indeed does help us find partners. But I'm saying when people are nasty and are abusive, they will use anything, including co-opting God into their nefarious schemes to try and control and, 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 and manipulate women's lives. We must discourage that as people of faith. People must be able to reach out and talk to people and negotiate and agree so that there's a commonality. We all agree, yes, let's set up a relationship. And this is how we want to manage this relationship. And it's a relationship of equals. You know, I remind the people of faith that if you read Genesis 1, 26, God is very clear. He says, let us create a human being and a human being in our image. And then the Bible continues. It says, God created them male and female. And he gave them authority over everything that God has created, except each other. So both men and women, in fact, the phenomenon of equality is a biblical concept. You know, it's nothing outside of our understanding of uh, the, 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 the narrative of creation as given to us in the scriptures. Now, we need, I think, as people of faith to then say, yes, these challenges are happening even within our own. Can you say church is supposed to be a safe space? It's a safe space for men, but not for women. Because women are always accosted, even in church. You know, I, I listened to somebody, Pablo, who, as a pastor, we're having a workshop, and somebody said, hey, Mfundis, you know the part I like in church? is when before you have communion, you have to give each other peace, you know? And, and we have to hug and uh, embrace and, and, and whatever. And this man, this man says, you know, Fundis, when that peace comes, I always make sure I'm close to so-and-so. Now, that is, that is a, a, a very nefarious thought because now this person, this giving of the peace is supposed to be sharing of agape love of everyone in the church. It's not about looking at somebody. And the person goes further and says, you know, when I go to her, I really grab her and I never let go. That is abuse. Abuse in the name of faith. Because here is now somebody who's taking advantage of something that is a ritual that is meant to be showing love and care and compassion for your fellow uh, uh, worshipers. And what does this person do? Target can, you know? So when that part comes, the guy will move towards where is Kanye sitting today? Let me go closer so that when it happens, I'm the first one to go and grab her. And then I squeeze so that I don't let her go. That is abuse in the church in the name of religion. Now, those things we must discourage. We must speak against them and say that is not acceptable. That is not what faith is about. So to answer you quickly, gender-based violence affects people in the church. We have many cases, there's the Omotoso case in the PE uh, uh, court at the moment, where not only one, but several women are lined up to tell their stories about how a man of faith abused them. There are several stories. There's a woman in Mamelodi who tells a story about how he was abused by a pastor in a church to a point where she, le she left the church. But this man continued to follow her, continued to harass her, continue to stalk her, continue to follow her where she lives and where she works. This is a man of God, so-called. And I'm saying so-called because sometimes I think we give these uh, titles so easily these days, you know. Anyone can be a man of God, whatever that means. I argue that all of us are people of God. And when we begin to reduce everything to that specific denominator, that all of us are people of God, then we need to treat each other with respect, with dignity, acknowledging that we are all sinful in the eyes of God. Sure, you know, you say that, uh, you say that about the church itself, uh, you know, being, if I have to use this word, perpetrators of gender-based violence in, in some of the customs that we have. And some of us were raised with these things being normal. In fact, you are raised to even look at women and say, hey, why are your boobs showing? Because 
we were taught that's wrong, but I was never taught that me as a man, I need to dress in a certain way. I must just show up the way I am. And I think there are many ways. I liked what you said that we must own up. So I think as a church, we need to continue repenting in how we address the issues of gender-based violence because there's something you said when we had our conversation on the phone and you said the church has been unfaithful in many ways in the issues of gender-based violence and it needs to continue to repent. And we, we, we ask God to, I mean, there are churches today where women are not allowed on the pulpit in the name of scripture. And when you read that scripture, it's like, how? Oh, can't he, this context most time is not what this thing means. But because men were raised with that understanding, we hold on to those beliefs. And indeed, may God help us and, and you know, uh, help us to see his heart and his design when he created human beings in this world. Let's, let's go to Kanye and, and say, Kanye, what, as, as a young woman who's active in the church, who's active in society, what would you say to other young women um, today in terms of um, their awareness of gender-based violence to know what are some of the signs of gender-based violence and not to accept um, some of the behaviors from us men and take them as normal because society has taught us that those are normal. When a man is treating you like this and like that, it's normal. How do we change that in society? And what did you say to fellow women about this issue of gender-based violence? Um, I really think it's important um, almost to not keep re-educating women to stand up for themselves. This um, gender-based violence really is a man issue. I'll keep saying this. So when it comes to how, what would I say to young women in the church? I would say, um, can the church teach the young men, like from the um, um, children's church to youth? You know, if, if the woman um, can relay the experiences, but ultimately it's, there's nothing that a woman can do to safeguard themselves from this gender-based violence. It's a man issue. So it, the minute we understand that and stop putting the power um, and, and stop almost like wanting women to come up with solutions for gender-based violence, you know, um, it really has to be the men who are leading. I'm glad this conversation, there are three men. You know, this is really good. Um, um, because really it's men who need to speak to other men. Um, and, and yes, as women, we need to understand where our support structures are, where do you go, what can you do? But I think there are enough platforms and even in schools, this new generation is not, stand, is not, um, is not putting up with this kind of behavior. They're not. The women, they're upset, enough is enough. They are, they are protesting, um, they are speaking out on, on social media, they have campaigns um, and independent campaigns as well. Just, um, exposing men, hashtag me too. So there are things that women are doing and being exposed, but what needs to happen is there needs to be more of the men engaging this topic. Until that happens, as women, we, 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 don't, we don't have that power to change men. <laughs> we, we really don't. We don't have the power to change men's behavior. And I do not think there's anything wrong with our behavior that I would need to warn women about. Mm. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that sentiment. Uh, I agree with that sentiment, definitely. Um, and, and it's really a man issue and it's a man problem and men must own up. Like Reverend said, the church must own up, men must own up. You know, there was that hashtag, like you say, young people are now standing up. There was a hashtag, men are trash. And a lot of my friends, um, kept uh, saying, but I don't abuse women. I don't agree with this hashtag. I don't abuse women. I don't agree with this hashtag. But that's not the issue. The issue is not you. The issue is men in general are trash. And we need to own up and agree that men are trash until gender-based violence ends in this country. Men will remain trash. And we need to understand that and take it serious. Sylvester, back to you. You were still explaining to us why you never shared this with your family and why you think uh, families can be a safe space in the society.
I, I was shameful. And you know, there's something that Baba Fana said a uh, couple of weeks ago when he and I were, were talking about a similar type of subject. And that is that whatever happens in darkness has power. When it's brought out in the light, it has no more power. So secrecy has power. And because I kept it quiet for so long, it had power because it stayed with me. It affected my outlook on life. It affected my self-worth. And the suppression that I thought was dealing with the issue was actually just letting the issue fester for even longer. But this is what I, I then found. So in December of last year, when I opened up to my mother, is because she opened up to me about her own secret and her own secret that had to do with me. And that was that I was a product of rape. And what one can see is how these two things are interconnected. That she suffered a most brutal crime that led to me being in this world. And because she kept it in secret, she kept it into the, in the dark and in its own way, because we are spiritual people, it had a power that was holding us back from the promises of God for our lives. Because this is what I said, Pavalo, when my mother told me that I was a product of rape, and that led to me writing my book, that I may have been a product of rape, but I know that I was chosen by God. So I may not have been my mother's choice, but clearly God had a much bigger plan that was beyond my mother, that was beyond me. And it is for us to realize as believers that we are vessels. And we are vessels not for our own good, but for God's good, for his light to shine into the world. Because imagine today when I can talk to somebody who themselves is a product of rape, and maybe they are contemplating taking their own life, maybe they are contemplating uh, you know, bringing the head to an end, that for me, it didn't break me to know that I was a product of rape. If anything, I said, God has a much higher calling for my life because I believe that I serve a God of purpose. And there is no way that God has called me into being for no particular purpose and no particular reason. But it is because the stronghold of darkness, of secrecy of the devil does not have power because I choose not to look at the fact that I'm a product of rape. I choose to look at the fact that I'm a child of God. And how I was conceived is not greater than the purpose that he has for my life. But really not talking about the abuse and I guess it's something that happens even now, when I talk about the fact that I'm a product of rape, it makes some people in my family uncomfortable. I got told by some family members that, but we don't talk about those things in public. And I said, but then what are you saying? Are you saying that I must be shameful of who I am because I know my worth in Christ? And therefore, I choose not to be shameful about who I am because if I then choose to once again perpetuate the secrecy, then I choose to put God's light under a blanket. And the choice that I have made is that I will not keep it secret. I will tell my story because my story needs to reach those who need to hear it. And not for my own good. I'm doing God's work. And if I'm doing God's work, then I know that I'm not here to please men. I'm here to do that which is pleasing to my God. But definitely, sometimes in our families, in our community, we want to hush these things because, no, 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 we don't talk about these things in public. What will people say? What will people say? Guess what? People are talking in any case. People were speculating in any case about whether the man that raised me was my father or not. It just was happening in secret. So I guess, I guess what you're saying to us, investor, is that anything that people are experiencing, if they keep it secret, then it continues to hold them captive. And 
families need to be safe spaces where people can see an opportunity to share and churches as well, Reverend, uh, be safe spaces where when something happens to people, they know where to go to share and get support, you know. Um, but Reverend, uh, and you know, when I Sylvester, before I go to Reverend, I just want to say that I can imagine how many boys have gone through abuse who've never had an opportunity to see things the way you see them, who are continuing to perpetuate and abuse others without knowing that it's actually, like I said earlier, their experience that's causing them to do this. So we really, um, yeah, and, 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 and we really need to look at this thing also, you know, from how we've been raised culturally and otherwise. But Reverend, I'll come back to you, Sylvester. Uh, Reverend, the president in the first month of COVID, in the month of, of, I think it is the month of March, we were told from the statistics released by Minister Peggy Kale and the president then went to announce it, categorized South Africa as having the second pandemic of gender-based violence. And 87,000 women were abused in one way or the other. And those are only the figures that were reported to the police, which means there's a possibility that it's more than that. And I would like you to just quickly tell us about the work that Sonke Gender Justice is doing around raising awareness on issues of gender-based violence. And also, within this period of COVID, have you experienced an increase in calls, in requests from women, has the abuse gone up as we see in statistics? How has been the pressure in your organization in terms of dealing with these cases of gender-based violence and the work you do? You are on mute, Reverend. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, Pablo, the, 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 the truth of the matter is that the, the lockdown, we saw a spike in cases of gender-based violence and that was to be expected. Uh, South Africa, as we all know, um, has high levels of gender-based violence anyway. Um, and, and so lockdown made things even worse because it meant for men who are perpetrators of uh, violence against women, who now had to be in a lockdown situation with uh, those that they are abusing. It meant the women who were caught up in that environment could not even go out and report because the regulations were stipulating that no one should go out. Many of them, the only outlet was to call the, the toll-free number. And as you say, Pablo, the only statistics we have are those women who managed to call the call center. But you can imagine if you are living with your perpetrator 24 seven and is sitting here, how do you even begin to pick up that phone and call a call center to say, I'm being abused? Because that in itself will attract violence on you. And so there are many women who are sitting there who are caught up in this environment and can't even report because their perpetrator is next to them 24 seven. So what we have been given as statistics by the uh, Minister of Police is just a fraction of what may be actually happening out there. One of the partner organizations we work with, Teddy Bear, which many of you will know, which works with children, received an extraordinary number of children as well who were calling during this time because they are being abused by their fathers at home. And, and, and so we really are confronting a difficult a situation where, you know, men who are frustrated by either lack of economic activity or access to things that they're used to getting uh, in their lockdown situation, they are taking that out on their partners, taking that out on those that are close to them, taking it out on those that they've professed that they love, and, but now they are treating them you know, hor horribly. And so what we try and do at Sonke, of course, we ourselves don't have access to one of them, challenges, of course, with the lockdown regulations, GBV was never declared an essential service, which meant, you know, those organizations that are very important, that provide support to survivors, 
provide counseling services, provide psychosocial support, could not even do any of those activities during the lockdown. And so what we did at Sonke was, you know, to use at least access to social media. We developed tools and most of these were targeting men specifically as I think Kanye appropriately made a very strong point. The issue of gender-based violence is not about women, really. You know, women are on the receiving end of violence that is meted out by men. The challenge we are facing here is how do we talk to our men and boys so that they do self-reflection and can change from this nasty behavior of you know, treating women as if you know, women are, are, are their uh, 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 property. And, and so our, our attempt at Sonke was then to develop tools where we were saying to men, this is how you need to conduct yourself during this lockdown. Seeing that you are at home, you are not going to work. How do you support your partner in terms of the house chores? Because we think once we begin to do that, we help to share the burden of care at home, which on the many instances, it's laden on women who have to care for everybody, prepare breakfast, clean the house, cook, and help the children with the schoolwork. Even if the man is there and all he does is just read the newspaper or just watch TV the whole day. So we encourage men to say, help your partner, share the house chores, share the, 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 the care of the children, because these are your children as well. These are not women's children. These are our children as well. And so that was our major focus. Uh, um, we developed a video clip, which is um, out there in the, in the social media space, where we were talking to communities and families around issues of gender-based violence, providing some guidance on what to do in an event where people may be confronted by these things. We linked people to service points so that when people were confronted by some of the challenges, they must know where they can call. And we provided numbers for very key service providers in civil society. Your organizations like POA, ADAPT, that provides psych psychosocial support, or even the, the, the GBV call center number. Because sometimes people may be caught up in an environment where they're abused. They don't even know where they can call. And so we provided this information to encourage uh, people to, to reach out when they were having troubles. Mm -hmm. and, and there's much that needs to be done, of course, Sylvester. I myself have called on the churches to say, we have clergy like yourselves. Some of you have been trained in pastoral care and counseling. What, what are you doing at this time of lockdown? Why are you not making yourselves available just to be on the phone so that women who are desperate, who need somebody to talk to, can just pick up the phone and call you and have somebody that can help them and counsel them over the phone so that they are able to at least deal with the challenges that they are facing. So I think there's a lot that we can do as people of faith in providing solace and comfort to those that are aggrieved and are facing challenges in their lives. Because after all, what is the church for if it is not there to serve those that are facing challenges in their lives every day? Then the church has got no meaning if it's not available to provide uh, support. Jesus talks about the salt of the earth, you know, and he says, if the salt loses its, its saltiness, it is unworthy, it must just be thrown out. And I think there's a lot that we as a church needs to do a self-reflection and say, given these challenges that we are facing of gender-based violence, both in society and within our faith communities, what is it that we are doing to make a difference? What is our contribution? Are we re-victimizing uh, people that have been victimized or we actually provide uh, support that makes a difference? For instance, you know, you made an example yourself that you, you, you always hear people confronting young women in church. You know, why are you wearing like this? You know, when somebody who has been abused, for instance, who has been raped, who are the first people to condemn them? It's people in the church. You know, people will say, yeah, but she likes to wear short things. That she's calling for this. As if only people who wear short skirts are raped. Let me tell you, if a rapist wants to rape you, it does not matter what you are wearing. You can wear the longest dress. 
You can wear a barka that is worn by the Muslim women. If a man wants to rape you, he will rape you. You know, because rape is not about what you are wearing. Rape is about power and control over women's bodies. And what, what we need to do then as, the, as, as people of faith is how do we create a safe space in the worship environment so that people that are aggrieved can come to us and we can provide them with support. Some of the women that I talk to sometimes tell me horrifying stories. They go to a pastor and say, no, my partner is doing this, my partner is doing that. You know what the pastors say? No, my child, it's a demon. We will pray, it will go away. I, I'm, not, I'm not one who says prayer has got not power, but I'm like James. James says, if you want to show me that your faith is strong, show me also through the works of what you do. So there must be a combination of us praying and also acting because God, when we pray, answers through us. We are the instruments of God. We are the elements that God uses to answer people's prayers. So you can't just pray and say, no, 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 things are going to go away. That is why Jesus says, you know, when you confront people that are hungry, don't pray for hunger to go away. Provide something. Give people something so that at least you give them a sense of hope as you pray for things to happen. That's why the Lord's prayer says, give us this day our daily bread, because God knows that we need this bread every day of our lives. And therefore, for those of us that God has given the means, let us provide for those that cannot provide for themselves. And in this instance, it requires us as men to call each other out, as Sylvester was saying. If I see that Pablo, you are doing something that is wrong, even if you are a brilliant preacher in our church, I must be able to call you aside and say, my brother, I don't think it is correct that you speak like this to our fellow women in our church. You need to really treat them with dignity and respect so that indeed we acknowledge them as people that are created in the image of God. And that is what we need to reinforce all the time so that we become a church where it is a safe space for everyone to come and feel comfortable that they are there to worship God and nothing else. Mm. Sure. Yeah, I guess he hearing you speak, it's clear that um, the main, the main uh, responsibility lies with the church. The church must really take um, ownership and see itself as God's hands and feet, as the vessel that God wants to use as a solution to bring salt and light in the earth. So, Let's get back to you, Delin. Um, in terms of uh, way forward, let's say that uh, we know that in our society, perpetrators, they thrive in isolation. You know, isolating the abused, uh, uh, the victims, and making sure that they don't get access to outside world or threatening them in one way or the other. What happens when the abused person is ready to leave the abusive environment? children and women, what avenues are there for them that they can go to? Or what suggestions do you have that you think you can put forward for women and children who are abused, who are ready to leave those abusive environments? Well, look, there's different options here. One of the options in terms of the Domestic Violence Act is to um, make it part of the order that there should be emergency, emergency monetary relief which will allow a victim of domestic violence who's obtained a protection order to um, be able to get alternative accommodation. If that's not possible, or for example, um, you know, the person is not a person of means, then the, the woman is actually stymied sometimes and has to go back to home unless she's able to obtain a place at, at a shelter. And there are some shelters available, but not enough. And if she's not able to find a place at a shelter, she's actually forced to go back home because that piece of paper while giving her protection doesn't provide her with shelter, doesn't provide her with shoes on her children's feet, for example. And I think that's where civil society comes in, where neighbors come in, where uh, churches come into play. Um, John Maxwell says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think the big thing here is, are we willing to open our homes to give a person a place to stay, to give them a plate of, of food, um, instead of actually turning around and saying, oh my goodness, but the woman went back to, to, to the husband. Um, you know, it, it couldn't be so bad. But sometimes it is bad, but they just have absolutely no alternative. 
Sure. So um, what you are suggesting, if I'm hearing you correctly, is that uh, churches like ours can, can create spaces, safe spaces for abuse victims where they can come in and be safe and be kept safe until they find a new avenue where they can move to. Oh, absolutely, because I mean, your family violence and protection units within the police have a family violence, you know, a specific room where they can interview victims at the police station, but that's no place for a person to stay overnight. Um, so yes, we, it's very, very necessary for civil society to step up and say, you know, we have got a safe space, whatever that might be, so that a person has the courage um, and the assurance that if they are going to take this huge step, that they are able to get out of the home. Because if they go back, it might actually incite further violence. So what I'm hearing you emphasize is that we need to go back to the teachings of Jesus, where he says, who is your neighbor and how do you treat your neighbor? So if we know of a child or of a woman who's been abused, we as uh, uh, community members should take responsibility and put those people in our homes, look after them, look after the children. As churches, I'm hearing you say, it is our responsibility as well to find ways in the process of healing for the abused children, for the abused women, and be some kind of a safe space for them. So that's what I'm hearing from you. And this, this, this issue about churches taking more responsibility and playing an active role, the entire panelist, have been emphasizing that and re-emphasizing that. And I'm hoping that we are listening as a church and we are listening as members of the society and community and we won't just keep quiet because they say silence in itself is abuse. Absolutely. I can only just agree with you. Yeah. Kanye, as we draw this to a close, um, <clears throat> In the work that you do with young people, what are some of the practical things that you think would be helpful to teach young people today? Because what we are taught when we are young is what's gonna result in us in the future like we are seeing now. The violence we see in men today is a product of what happened to them at a young age. And um, what do you think in the work of young people uh, as a young person yourself is the work that we need to instill in, 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 in young people today? Okay, um, I wanna start with um, the youth. Um, what I think churches should do is I think churches should equip and empower the youth to be champions um, for these social injustice issues. You'll find that the youth is already passionate and is waiting for the church to say something, to do something, um, because as I've said, this generation is not taking this. So one of the things that the church can do is, is empower the young people to be activists within the church. You know, um, give them the resources, give them the space, give them the voice in the church to be able to do this. And by this, I mean, if they want to do a little skit on a Sunday um, to teach, you know, um, about these issues, allow them to do that. Um, and I think young people learn um, when, when they're given a space to voice, to express, and to teach. So I do think that um, allowing the church, um, young people and youth to be able to be think tanks for the church, because they, they have nothing to lose and they are very expressive and they have lots of emotions and lots of things to say, opinions. So if the church can give them that space, you know, they, they can come up with solutions. The youth nowadays have access to um, lots of information. So they know more than people give them the credit. So give them the voice and space in the churches to, to, to speak into these issues, to, um, to, to um, revel in it and, and just um, come up with um, expressive, creative ways to communicate back to the church. So yeah, that's what I would say in a, in a very practical, general um, thing for the church when it comes to young people and the youth. Sure, thank you for that, Kanye. Um, yeah the youth in the church has a voice and that voice must be heard. Sylvester, in closing, what would you say the role of women, um, the shift, the shift of culture of gender-based violence 
is in society? Like what, what, do you, what do you say the shift should be from a men perspective and from uh, the work that you do? What are some of the practical examples that you can give us in shifting the culture of gender-based violence and the role of women in society? Sure. I think on, on the side of men and young boys in particular is that we need to start early. I, I'm always a believer and I, I advocate that we must design our society for the outcomes that we want to see. We, we have broken systems. We have broken family systems. And what happens is that when we try and intervene when a crime has been committed, it is a little bit too late for the survivor or, or the victim. Because one thing that you must be aware that when a crime has been committed, let's look at, for example, the cases uh, of murder that we've witnessed uh, in our country, where the lot of Karabo has been murdered and, and so on. What you must realize is that there are two families that have been left broken, the family of the victim and the family of the perpetrator. We must find a way as society to bring healing on both sides of the fence. Now, imagine a child who is a product of rape who goes on to commit abuse himself or herself for that matter. And we need to be able as a society to really go to the depth of where the problem lies. We have broken family systems. We have many boys that are raised by single parents, single mothers, and they are fatherless. They carry anger with them. The type of anger that I believe is fertile ground for some of the abuse that we see in society. So we have a role to play. So the work that I do with companies like the Character Company, which is an NPC, is about catching these young boys at the age of five years. Start really honing them. When we talk about positive masculinity or positive manhood, what does it mean? What does it mean to be a boy who one day is going to meet a partner who will be empowered? And what does that mean to have validation in self that does not have to be driven by external validation? So we do a lot of work with these young boys from a leadership point of view, from a counseling point of view, because as I said, they come from families and households where they may not have a father figure or a male figure in their lives. And I'm a believer that as single mothers, you can tell a boy how to be a man, but you can't show him how to be a man. So there is a role for, for men in extended families and community to play to those who are fatherless. And they are fatherless for many reasons. In the most cases, unfortunately, they are fatherless because as men, we've walked away from our responsibility. We've planted a seed and we've walked away from that seed and we've become rolling stones. But there's also a role for women to play. And whenever we call for women to play their role, we're not doing so to shift the blame from men. We are saying that the problem has to be tackled on both sides for us to be able to find the integration and completeness that is required. Because on the one side, as men, we must acknowledge that we are the problem, that we are a big cog in the solution. But on the other hand, we must acknowledge that women also have a role to play, however minute the role may be in the bigger scheme of things. When you look at the Omotose case that Baba Bafana has referenced, there are women who go to court and support Omotoso. There are women who would say things about the victims, like the Cheryl Zondo, for instance, and, and, and say things that unfortunately give fuel to men who abuse power, rank, and privilege, because guess what? There are women who are in support of us as men, that even when we've abused women, there are women who will stand up for us, who will go and support us in court and so on and so forth. But at a level of youth, here's what happened in darkness in the life that I used to live. We would have these sort of parties and so on. And the people that would socially traffic other girls were women themselves, were girls themselves. To take a young girl from Soweto and take them to Santin, uh, 
a party and so on. And knowing very well that this woman is going to be given alcohol, is probably going to be out of her depth, is going to be intoxicated. And this woman will be in a group of 10 other men and she would be alone. What do you think is going to happen to that woman at that particular place? So what I can say to young women is that let us also not become complicit in gender-based violence through actions that we have the foresight that at some of these gatherings that we call our friends and we invite them, the things that happen there are not things that tomorrow we want to talk about with pride. Sure. The baton is in our hands as men to become better men for society and to know that we are the problem. We are the problem because of privilege. All men are guilty. Mm. It does not pay for you to lift a hand to a woman to be a perpetrator of violence. We are guilty of power, rank, and privilege just on the basis that we are men. Yeah, sure. Guys, I'm looking at the time, and I know that we can have this conversation the whole day, and that's the thing about these conversations when spaces are created for them to, to really come out and you know, raise awareness. It can just flow forever and ever. But I'm going to thank you all for the time that you've made for us. We hope that we'll continue having these conversations. And we hope that next time we talk, in a few years down the line, we'll be celebrating the work that we're seeing as changing in the country and in the world where women won't be abused by us men and children won't be feeling the wrath of men in these societies that we live in. Reverend Bafana, just lastly, there are people who are listening to this conversation and they wonder, I was abused yesterday, but now I don't know who to call. Can you just share Sonke gender justice details and some of the campaigns that you are busy with now that people can partner with those who want to be part of a change going forward? Can you just share details of gen uh, your, your organization and how people can reach you? Well, uh, Sylvester, as you know, we are on lockdown, so we are all working from home at the moment, but uh, people can call us. Um, um, our number in Johannesburg is 011-339-3589, or you can reach us out through our website, www.genderjustice.org.za. Um, if you want to participate in these efforts, we have set up a campaign with the South African Council of Churches, the Catholic Bishops Conference, which is supported by the UN Women, which we call Faith Leaders Against Gender-Based Violence. And through that campaign, we are rolling out interventions that are mobilizing faith leaders generally to be engaged on the issue of GGBV. I can send you details, uh, 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 Pabalo, uh, on how people can join in this effort. This, you don't have to be a faith leader per se, because sometimes people think being a faith leader is being a bishop. But I think as Christians, we offer leadership in all spaces that we are in. I'm in this panel here with brilliant leaders of the church, which can only you know, augur well for the future of the church with these young people. And, and therefore, I would, I would urge that anybody who's willing to not only stand by the side way, but also become part of the solution to the challenge that we are facing, I will share the details with you, Pablo, and they can send their emails and we can connect because we meet virtually every week to talk through the strategies on how we can take these processes forward. So I would encourage, uh, for people to really stand up and be counted and not sit by the sideline as Sylvester says and say, no, but I don't abuse. The fact that you are quiet and silent, you are contributing to the abuse of women. What we need is people who will stand up and speak out, but also become partners with women in ensuring that we rid our country of the scourge of gender-based violence. That is what Jesus would expect of us, that we actually are at the cutting edge of what is happening in our society to make a difference and provide hope 
for change that must happen to the benefit of all in our society. Sure. And I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. And can you, I mean, our people in our, in our community know you, so they know how to reach you. Sylvester, you'll send me details as well on the initiative that you are running so that we can, we can share these details and give them to people who need to have this information in front of them should they need to get in touch with you. Because I believe partnership is the way forward. Partnership is the way forward. We need to spread the word through partnership. So we'll do that. Reverend, if you don't mind, can I ask you to close us in prayer? Yeah, sure, let us pray. Lord God of all mercy and grace, we thank you for this conversation as we talk about the difficult things that are confronting our country, particularly women, Lord God, that are created in your own image. We thank you for guiding us through this conversation. We pray for your intervention that you can give us the resolve to make the difference in the world. For you have called us that we must be co-creators with you in making the world what you wanted it to be so that all those that are created in your image can be treated with dignity and respect. We pray that you may help us have the resolve as full of faith that we can make a difference in a situation where we see a lot of destruction. Let us be an element of hope that can show that things can be different. We show that our country can be a different country with all the gifts that you have given to us. We ask you that you use us as your tools and instruments in making that a reality for all the people of our country, particularly for women and girls. We ask all of this in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Kanye, Sylvester, Reverend Bafana, thank you so much. For creating the thank space you. and time to be with us. Keep well and hope to see you soon in either this space you, or the bye. other space. Bye. Thanks, bye. We hope that this conversation was meaningful to you and that you will not just listen and not act on something that have moved you today. So may God grant all of us the grace, the strength that we need as we continue to be his hands and feet in our society and as we fight the social ills that we experience today. Following Jesus, until we see you again next week, stay well, take care and much love. Shab shab.